Hi, this is Tracy de Gama Espinosa, and this is a video on mathematical learning trajectories. The information provided here is based on research we've been doing over the past 15 years uh, related to mathematical learning in the brain. And to do this, I want to invite you to reflect along the way as you're looking at this information. Please note down all of the questions that you might have and, and frame this as I see, I think, I wonder. And we will be using that as a jumping off point for the discussion in the following weeks, okay? Today we are going to define terms. Then I'm going to tell you a little story about the research that began this entire uh, quest to understand uh, mathematical trajectories. And then we're going to talk about core notions in mathematics as far as learning trajectories are concerned, how that aligns with the current day curriculum that we actually have, and what this means for hierarchical concepts in the brain. So let's begin with some definitions. Uh, we'll start off with heuristics. Heuristics is kind of the go-to place in your brain, which your brain will do to think really fast about something. Typically speaking, it saves a lot of energy to do that. So to perceive the world and to understand things that are going on around you and to learn takes a lot of energy. So the very first thing your brain does when it looks at something new, like a new math problem, is decides whether or not it's going to go high cognitive load. Yes, I'm going to invest in the memory and attention, or I'm going to go low cognitive load and basically use whatever I already know uh, to resolve the problem. Now, sometimes you do a combination of both of these, but this is just to illustrate that it takes a whole lot more energy to pay attention and to create new memories in order to be able to think and eventually learn uh, than it does just to use simple heuristics and use the things that you've already known. The benefits of heuristics are that it makes you think really fast, but the drawbacks are that it can create bias because you just presume the world is as it was when you first looked at it, which is a good smart thing to do, typically speaking, but sometimes you have new information and you're not taking that into consideration. So we want to talk about how your brain typically uses heuristics. It's kind of the go-to place as far as energy is concerned. The law of minimal effort, you know, the brain would like to invest as little energy as possible to get as much out of new learning as possible. So heuristics and bias just means that, you know, your brain is efficient and it tries to save energy where it can. And that means that heuristics are inevitable. Um, but heuristics, while they can be useful, they can also be a little bit dangerous because it can lead to unconscious bias that blocks new learning, okay? So the second word we want to look at has to do with these uh, learning trajectories and understanding what we mean by coming to the learning sciences. We want to go from just educating to actually nurturing our information about teaching and learning from a lot of different scientific fields. And this means that instead of just presuming that there's a typical trajectory of, you know, I teach A and therefore the student's going to get B, you know, this, this happens, it's a delivery process. We now know that that's just not true. That's not really uh, linear at all. It's, it's far more circular. Uh, there's a lot of iterative processes, like a little bit of learning, uh, two steps forward and one step back along the way. And additionally, teaching is a complex word. It means a lot of things. The teacher has to diagnose where the kid is and plan and then put things into context and then help him reflect and, and think about the, the outcomes that are being achieved through the certain methodologies being used and then how they apply that information and how does the teacher motivate the student to learn and give good feedback. And on the other end, the student is, you know, interpreting what that teacher might be meaning and hopefully they're understanding things in the correct way so they can build off of their prior knowledge and then reinforce through rehearsal the information that they have to consolidate new information and eventually, hopefully, be able to transfer that into a new context. And so the teaching learning dynamic is very, very complex in the sense that it's not linear. Additionally, we measure it in the learning sciences in a lot of different levels. We look at this from a molecular level individual level, classroom level, and global societal level, which means that you're looking at a lot of different fields uh, information at the same time. This means you're going to study synapses and the way the brain makes neural connections, which also going to look at that one kid in a classroom and how they are reacting to that new information, as well as the dynamics uh, that the classroom itself creates, and then trying to compare that on an international scale. So there's a lot of different levels of analysis that occur within the learning sciences. So the big idea here is um, just to enjoy and embrace this complexity. Teaching is the most 
important profession in society. Without teachers, there would be no society as we know it today. But we mean to improve this process by basing all of our choices and decisions in the classroom on evidence. And we should improve the professionalization of our field by moving towards being learning scientists, not just educators or teachers, but people who actually use science and evidence to support our practices. And this began back in 2017 with the OECD publication, which will be in your folder so that you're able to have a deep dive into this 300 page document. But the basic recommendation was that teachers need to know more about the brain and more about technology to work better. Additionally, we were asked to compile a list. Actually, the school that asked us to do this really just said, well, it's a book that you would tell us that we should read if all of our teachers want to convert towards being learning scientists. And when we began to pull together our list and then we sent the list out to all the people on this list and we said, well, what else would you add or what would you take away? We ended up having about 101 perspectives on the learning sciences that are meant for teachers and we hope that you're able to dive into that and maybe have a look at some of those books and articles to support your own understanding of the information. So this leads us to the second big idea, which is that designing educational experiences without understanding the brain in a better fashion, a little bit more detail, is definitely uh, working at a handicap. So we really do have to learn more about the basics or fundamentals of how the brain works. And a lot of you know a lot of this information through psychology, and now what we're doing is trying to bring this all into the hard science of, of neuroscience as well, okay? The third idea is that we know that language and mathematics are real cornerstones of all educational programs. All subjects are mediated by language and every single intelligence test in the world tests mathematics as well, right? And so um, that's a key idea. The second part of that is that this happens in a neuro constructivist trajectory. And unfortunately, this also means that we know that students who start behind stay behind unless teachers understand how to fill in those gaps of prior knowledge that may be missing. So to illustrate all this, I want to tell you a story. And this has to do with research we were asked to do by the government of Costa Rica back in 2013, in which they came to us with a problem. They said that 17% of their kids were not able to pass from kindergarten into first grade because they just didn't have the prerequisite knowledge. They didn't have preliteracy and they didn't have early numeracy understanding to be able to deal with first grade. And so they wanted to know exactly what to do about that. And we did this as a follow-up and, and also presented our information in the World Educational Research Association's yearbook. Uh, in 2015, and then I wrote a book about this idea in 2019, um, and have for the past um, couple of years been really looking more deeply into the neural networks that create this neural trajectory for learning. And so, based on their problem, not all students could get into first grade. Of course, the schools think the home isn't doing enough. <laughs> okay, that's possible. But also that the, the state preschools were not prepared uh, well enough to give students what they needed to have those fundamental skills to be ready to learn to do math uh, and to do reading and writing in school. And so they said, you know, look, we've tried everything. So just what does neuroscience have to say? Because we've tried everything else. So what was fascinating is that we were able to develop with them three different hypotheses, right? The first is that school failure is due at least in part to the underdevelopment of certain neural pathways, prerequisite neural pathways for core notions um, that they weren't getting for some reason, okay? The second hypothesis had to do with this idea that uh, we believe that more students would find more success in language and math in school if there was an orderly presentation of lower level or basic information before they went to higher information. So basically there was a clear hierarchy or a clear trajectory of learning that needed to occur that sometimes was not occurring. And the third hypothesis that we had is that the order of the presentation of this information in math and language was much more important than the age of the student. And what we were seeing in some of the curricular structures is that what concepts that were introduced were not necessarily in the right order, or at least the way the brain would naturally find a way to build up this hierarchy. So we took a deep look at these three different hypotheses in the study that we did. Now to do that, just get some basic terminology under our, our belt. You know, synapses 
are, uh, structures are links, connections between neurons in the brain, right? And the pathways, you have a lot of synapses that create these pathways, and many pathways will then develop networks for learning in the brain, okay? And so learning depends on well-functioning neural networks, and the networks depend on pathways, and the pathways depend on the synapses. And a key point that comes out with all of the research I'm looking at, math and the brain, is it's not in a single part of the brain, um, but rather in dozens of different networks and pathways that occur throughout brain areas. What also becomes clear with new imaging and with these mapping techniques is that you can see where key nodes and hubs are, which is where uh, electrical signals will pass uh, through multiple times. So if we look at this sort of from what happens in a classroom structure, we talk about a domain, you know, in, in school we teach language, we teach math, we teach history, we teach art. So you have these academic domains, but if you really break those down, there's a lot of sub-elements to that, right? To do math, you need magnitude recognition, and you need addition and subtraction and multiplication and all these other points, right? But those break down even further into different pathways. And so we know that there's different symbols and size and whole numbers and communal properties and associative properties and how to count and number lines and all these other things that are needed for all these other elements. And then when they all come together, you can actually see that the kid understands the notion of quantity or relationships. And so a key to understanding the way the brain works and how things are measured is to understand that we're not ever measuring math in the brain. You're actually looking at sub pathways or sub elements or sub domains within those pathways and how those things work to create that observable behavior. So to put it in another format and to give some very specific neural pathway explanations, if you can see that the kid can do one plus two equals three, we know that at least 16 different neural pathways have to be functioning. At a very basic level, the kid has to be able to see and touch and hear. Um, interesting enough, you know, smell and taste don't have a lot to do with learning math, but anyways, um, physiologically speaking, neural networks for these elements have to be functioning, right? But also you have to have general cognitive abilities, memory, attention, executive functions, as well as put all of that into context, motivation, self-esteem, the relationship with the uh, content and the materials and the pre people around you. Then you finally get to domain-specific neural pathways, which have to do with these symbols, patterns, orders, categories, and relationships, as well as number sense. And what people typically think about when they talk about, well, where is the math part of the brain? They're actually looking at how the brain processes, for example, symbolic versus non-symbolic number identification or patterns in the brain, or the way the brain orders things or put things in categories or has relationships. These types of things are typically what is measured, domain specific, but if you don't take the physiology of the body, and you don't take general cognition or context into play, you also don't have learning. So um, it's very important to think of mathematical learning as being all of these elements all together, okay? And so here's the fourth big idea, and I really hope you really memorize this, love this word. It's really pretty fascinating, but the brain works as a holon, okay? And a holon is defined as something that is simultaneously whole and a part. Like you can have a leaf, and the leaf can be part of a tree, part of a tree. But you can also break down that leaf into smaller parts, right? And that tree can also be a part of a, a forest, right? And the forest can be part of, you know, a country, and the country can be part of the world or whatever. Everything can be broken down into smaller parts, and everything can be made bigger. And that's kind of what we do as master teachers, right? We figure out how to break down the information into all of these smaller parts, teach them, then we have to remember to pull them all back together again so that the students will actually understand all of that conceptual knowledge that we're throwing at them either in language, math, or any other subject area, okay? So what this means is that your brain can be a whole in and of itself, but it can be broken down into smaller parts, right? Including those uh, networks and pathways and synapses and neurons. Um, but it's also a part of your body. And those bodies can be holes in and of themselves, right? And this little child, right? She's a whole thing all by herself, but she's also part of a family. And she's also part of a school community or, or the soccer team or whatever, right? And so we know that 
everything in the natural world can be divided into wholes and parts, which is pretty fascinating, right? So if we think about this, it's a really great way to sort of break things down as far as mathematical conceptual knowledge or any kind of conceptual knowledge and how it works within the brain as well. So um, we're going to dig into that deeper in class three, but for now, let's just look at what the evidence says. And starting back around the mid 2000s, we started to get better information about the brain. We started to see that, for example, looking at the number three, the Arabic number three versus the word three versus three dots was actually in different parts of the brain, which is just so cool. This is absolutely fascinating. We also realized that if people did addition on paper and pen versus mental addition or mental subtraction, they were using different parts of their brain. It was also clear that when we asked them to guess, you know, how many jelly beans in this jar, right? Magnitude estimation. That was a distinct neural network as well, which was also very different from looking at numerical cognition, understanding what a number actually meant as far as a symbolic representation of magnitude. And then we had multiplication versus spatial rotation tasks, just comparing what was going on in the brain when you did multiplication in your head versus when you were asked to rotate a figure all distinct neural networks in the brain. And so um, we even got to this point of understanding math anxiety, which is kind of funny because you don't have, you know, research on, you know, art anxiety or history anxiety, but you do have math anxiety, which is pretty interesting as well to see how that impaired other parts of the brain. It actually impeded signaling that would be important for magnitude understanding, for example. So anxiety can be detrimental to all learning. We know that for sure. All of this was to say that after we looked at about 650 different studies in the mathematical realm, we found that there was at least 16 neural networks, those that were related to sensory perception, those for context, those for general cognition and domain-specific areas, were for the four big categories, and those broke down into 16 neural networks, which we'll look at in just a second. And so the big idea is that there's at least these 16 neural networks and these 16 neural networks themselves um, subdivide into different pathways, so sub-sub areas of learning. And so this is really important for teachers to understand. It's not that you're just teaching math. You are stimulating the visual understanding of information in a good social context in order to create a good memory so that that kid could actually understand the symbolic representation to get to the ability to do a math problem. So it's a very complex process and it's divided into these four big groupings of neural networks. Um, and there may be more. This is just what we know up to date, okay? So if you look at, for example, vision, if you subdivide vision, there are distinct neural networks that determine color versus luminance versus motion versus size or proximity or perception versus action or faces versus other objects or search and saliency and visual crowding and spatial frequency. All of these different pathways under vision come together to allow you to be able to see something. But if any one of those is off, you're going to have a hard time doing math, for example. Similarly, motor abilities can be subdivided in multiple ways, as can other elements of physiology. Similarly, looking at social-emotional aspects of learning, those subdivide into multiple pathways and sub-sub-sub pathways. Um, the interaction between student and caregiver, all of those things change uh, your ability to learn. Self-esteem, do you believe that you are a learner? Um, uh, motivation, all of those different sub-elements play into your ability to learn math, as does general cognitive abilities, um, for example, of memory, attention, and executive functions. And so memory, attention, and executive functions are sub-sub-subdivided uh, in multiple ways. Very interesting because executive functions are actually now shown to be nothing more than memory and attention networks, which is pretty fascinating. Um, but all of that together combines to give you the ability to learn anything in the whole world. Now, once you've got those three networks of physiology, contextual networks of understanding, and you have general cognition, now you can think about what kind of learning we're doing. So that's the general basis for being able to learn. Then to know 
domain specific understanding for example how does your brain do math um, that's a whole new kettle of fish and that's a lot of research is um, going on in those spaces to actually look at how your brain does math and so in terms of cognition there is a number sense it's pretty fascinating but the brain is born with the ability to understand more and less before a baby can articulate it so it's nonverbal comparative information but aside from a number sense um, your brain is able to understand symbols uh, which is pretty fascinating because there are things that have to do with symbolic and non-symbolic magnitude measurements and how you label quantity for example but this means not only you know numbers numbers themselves but also the objects that might be related to numbers and then non-numerical symbols that indicate processes like addition or subtraction or division right and so your brain is looking at these in very distinct ways how it processes numbers is slightly different from how it processes non-numerical symbolic understanding right and so all of these sub elements just because a kid can understand numbers doesn't mean he understands the equal sign and that's pretty fascinating we spend a whole lot of time talking about numbers, but we don't spend as much time talking about the symbols that go with them, right? And those symbols include things like geometric shapes. And geometric shapes are also a part of mathematical understanding. And so that's a really huge element is how does your brain understand and categorize, we'll get to categories in a second, um, different shapes. And can it look at them as two or three dimensional objects? Then we have order. And understanding order is vital to all mathematical skills, right? And so ordinality versus cardinality or also understanding sequence orders or positional values is all very important. And so your brain has a bunch of sub, sub, sub networks related to, to these subcategories. Order, for example, can be something as, as basic as something I learned in back in school. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, right? The order of operations, which I guess now we hear people talk about bottomless or bracket order, divide, multiply, add, subtract. But on top of that, the way that you order or group symbols or then you use exponents and then you divide and multiply and add and subtract these operations are different ways that order plays into a conceptual understanding of mathematical knowledge and this goes all the way down into matching orders of numbers with symbols one plus two equals three it uses very similar symbols except for the plus and minus side and to three minus two equals one so once a kid gets the symbols down, then you can talk about order and you can talk about, you know, show them one plus two is three and three minus two is one and ask them, what do they get from that? That's a huge mental leap to understand the difference between addition and subtraction and how the order of those numbers plays into that, right? But also, in addition to symbols and order, you have patterns. Repetition, regularity is a big part of math. We also know that patterns are a part of our natural world as well as our human-made world. Patterns that we are able to perceive around us are a very natural way to begin to structure itself. Understanding patterns in nature, being able to see, you know, fractals, uh, is something that's a very huge part of beginning to understand the way that patterns um, play a role within mathematical understanding. And then once you can combine patterns again with symbols, then you're able to see how you can have patterns based on, for example, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two, will end up giving you a different kind of understanding for the symbols two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, and so on. And so understanding patterns is another key way that your brain creates these trajectories of understanding. And the last two, um, a lot of people confuse them, but categories and relationships are different. Categories of information is how your brain basically says, let's put objects together. I don't know if you guys remember Sesame Street, but they used to say one of these things is not like the other, and they would have you categorize them based on your understanding of the information. And so mental schema are pretty powerful in terms of category learning. Um, and this goes for something as simple as, you know, card games and how can we make different categories of cards, for example, based on their numbers or based on their suits, based on their color, that would determine different types of categorization schemes that we can have. But we also naturally break down mathematics into different categorical types of numbers. And this is something that we make presumptions about, but it's very, it's a big concept to get uh, to understand those different types of numbers. And so categories of understanding related to math and different types of math 
uh, are very important also within any domain specific area, but specifically in mathematics, right? And finally, relations. And this has a lot to do with approximations, decomposition of numbers, understanding equivalencies. But numbers also uh, exist, for example, in relations as we're, you know, charting. So, so graphing things has to do with understanding the relationship of the x-axis to the y-axis and how you can actually place that. But also relationships have to do with place value. So a lot of these uh, relationship concepts within math are things that the reason that symbols, patterns, order, categories, and relationships are important is that they tend to travel along certain similar neural networks. Things that are symbols tend to be grouped together in the brain, for example, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, this is also why, you know, teaching math and language separately makes no sense to your brain because your brain would just like prefer to have numbers and letters together because it reinforces those pathways. But what's important to understand is that every single study that we could find on math and the brain done on children was always based on one of those five things, symbols, orders, pattern, relationships, or categories, which is pretty fascinating information. So here are five big takeaways, additional takeaways from the story in Costa Rica. When they told us the kids aren't getting this, where, where is it coming from? What's the problem? What are they missing? Um, we were able to plot a hierarchy, a trajectory. This is my hand-drawn initial <laughs> look at, at how we had symbols, patterns, order, relationship, and categories, and how they actually created this hierarchical establishment of understandings. And this is to say, for example, if you don't know how to do addition, it's really hard for you to do subtraction um, because you're missing core fundamental notions about mathematics upon which subtraction can be taught, right? And so um, I thought that was pretty cool, but who am I? And so I sent this away to the people who actually authored many of these 650 studies. And I said, what do you think of this? And they loved it. Um, 21 of them, believe it or not, wrote back to say this is cool and it does match my work at least it matches my work so this gave me confidence to be able to share this information in the five pillars of the mind book the idea here is that there's core notions in math which are these fundamental building blocks upon which this previous knowledge upon which new information can be laid and the idea that we were coming up with when we we're trying to answer this question for the Costa Rican government, what's going on here is that when certain fundamental networks are missing, a child's unable to perform that task or any future task that relies on those core notions. So this means that a kid can sort of fake their way through addition, but if they get to subtraction and really didn't get addition, they're not going to be able to move forward on that. And so these fundamental notions are key here, and I hope you'll be able to read the full paper on this, which is in your folder. So a big idea that came out of this is that all of this learning depends on symbols, patterns, order, categories, and relationships. And these are how we were defining symbols, patterns, order, categories, and relationships based on this um, broader definition, um, every single neuroscientific study we could find on math fit into these categories, okay? A big aha moment came when we realized that this order was so much more important than the age of the student. If they were missing some prior knowledge, that was going to mess up everything from there on out. It didn't matter if they're seven and they should know how to read by now and they should be able to do addition by now. And let's teach them something else. If they were missing core notions, um, they were not able to have success. And that was what was happening to the kids. And so we realized that curriculum structures and schools are designed around age groups. Why? If any of you have a good answer for that, let me know. Because what the brain would prefer is if it was based on prior knowledge. So prior experience really has a huge influence on what you're able to learn in the future. So what does this mean? Education is super complicated and the brain is very complex, which means that simple solutions of just, you know, let's just move the kid on or, or policy that says by this particular date, all children should be able to do, you know, multiplication or whatever. Those are very simplistic uh, things compared to the complexity of what's really going on in each individual brain. And so we have to get a little bit more creative here as far as our reactions to this. And so two other ideas that come from that is that different classroom activities, and this is what many of you are getting with some of your comments, stimulate different neural networks. 
And what the, we found in the Costa Rican problem is that teachers were repeating one kind of activity over and over and over again, and kids were really getting their numbers down. They understood the numerical symbols, but they were not exercising other neural networks that were vital for the kids to then be able to do addition, for example, non-symbolic numerical representation. And so different activities stimulate different networks. And the bottom line is, if you're missing any of those, you can't do what is this observable skill of addition or subtraction or multiplication or whatever. You have to have all of these sub elements in place, solid working before you're able to move forward and to have that competency of being able to do addition or subtraction. So the final idea that we want you to write down is that do no harm means use evidence. And um, hopefully we, we will convince you of that um, as we go along. So some final understandings from all of this is that we know that neuroscience is really still in its infancy, but it is now providing really valuable information for discussion. So we know a lot more than ever before, but we know very little. So we have to keep an open mind, right? And we know that there's at least these 16 uh, neural networks that we have to take into consideration when we try to stimulate different areas um, to make sure that they have all of those networks primed before they go on to the next level of things. Um, but typical teaching practices don't typically stimulate all of these networks equally well, which means the early school failure they were seeing was at least partially due to the fact that they were not getting stimulated. Those networks were not stimulated enough so the kids couldn't handle the additional burden uh, or the weight of higher order conceptual thinking that was based on those core notions that they were missing. So what are part of the solutions? What is something you could do tomorrow? <laughs> Basically, you can reinforce the networks of the five pillars. We've seen teachers just simply call out, you know, more explicitly. Okay, so what symbols do you see here? What patterns are there here? Does order mean anything in this situation? Uh, what is the relationship between? You know, how many categories could you place this information? Just simply Calling to mind those things explicitly, asking them to use the five pillars is very good for reinforcing those basic neural networks that are domain specific for mathematics. The other part, uh, acknowledge and leverage um, emotions. There's no cognition without emotion and that's really huge to, to integrate into our classroom practices. That was domain specific in context, but when we look at general cognition, we have to be choosing activities that are either good for memory systems are good for attention systems are good for both or it won't stick or real learning isn't really happening and finally i have one last call to scale up learning interventions we tend to jump to the conclusion that the child has some mathematical deficiency or something going on when oftentimes it can be something at these lower levels if the kid doesn't see well and you've got him in the back of the room and we're wondering why he just doesn't get the math it might not have anything to do with math. It might just be he needs glasses or something like that, right? So look for physical roots. Physical things also have a lot to do with things like not eating breakfast or not getting enough sleep. So we know that physiologically speaking, you know, the body keeps score. It's going to give its reaction. You cannot learn without taking care of the body. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. So first look for physical roots to that kid not doing well in your class. If it's not physical, Look to the psychological. Is he being bullied? Are his parents getting a divorce? Um, does he feel like he belongs? You know, it may very well be a psychological root to the problem. He's not doing well in math because he's not feeling good about where he is. And so tap into that. If you realize it's not physical, it's not psychological, could there be a problem at a neurological level? Does he have attention problems or things like that? If he does, he has it across the board. It's not going to be like exclusive to your math class. He will have problems everywhere. Similarly, general cognition. If he has a problem with memory, attention, or executive functions, he's blowing it in all of his classes, okay? If it's none of these things, then maybe it has to do with a math problem or a language problem or an art problem, something that's domain specific. But try to scale up interventions to make sure that you're not jumping the gun on what really might just be a simple solution, okay? All right, with that in mind, please think a little bit about those definitions that we shared, this story about Costa Rica, and understanding this core notions and hierarchies and trajectories, and thinking about those practical steps that you might be able to apply immediately to try to leverage the information from the learning sciences in your own classrooms. And please write your I see, I think, I wonder, and send that in to us so that we're able to use that information for the next class. Thanks a lot.